So for those of you who are not familiar with me or client success, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Christy Falteruso. I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at Client Success. If you're not familiar with Client Success, we are a customer success management solution. We help customer success teams manage from what we say, new to renew, that entire post-initial sales lifecycle management. So think customer health, playbooks, management, engagement, surveys, all of that is packaged up into an easy to use solution, makes it really simple for you to orchestrate all of your post-initial sales programs, making sure that your customers are delighted and getting value from your solution. So if you're not familiar with us, you're, you're in the market, you're shopping for solutions, you want to know more about us, please head over to the Client Success website. You can go ahead and request a demo. One of our sales folks will be happy to reach out, uh, get you set up. Of course, if you want to speak to me, you want to speak to Dave Blake, our CEO, we're happy to have conversations with you as well. So if you want to reach out, get my opinions on client success, obviously I'm using it every day. Happy to be candid and share some of that feedback with you. Otherwise, please just head over to our website. Okay, so I mentioned we are in week three of a four week series with our customer success leadership boot camp. Um, so we've already covered designing a success probability score to predict customer success. Um, if you missed this, this score is something that I designed. It's a, a unique proprietary thing to client success in the sense that I created something new as a way for us to formulaically come up with and understand new prospects who are now coming and into uh, our customer portfolio, what is the probability that they can be successful? So we look at a whole bunch of different things there. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go back and rewatch that one. Last week, we talked about how to deploy a customer success management platform the right way. Um, I have now been using customer success software for 11 years. Uh, it is a, is a privilege to do so. I, can, I shared a bunch of best practices on like how to get yourself set up for success day one. So if you are in the market, if you're in the middle of an onboarding, whether it's with client success or any other platform, I think the feedback, the tools, uh, tips that we shared last week, hopefully will help you get started make it, maximizing the value that you get out of your platform. Today, a lot of teams, right, they're consolidating resources, they've got less people trying to figure out how can we sustain, how can we still drive impact for our customers. We're hearing a lot around scale. So today we're going to talk about how do you move to a pooled customer success model. Maybe you were a high engagement model, right, where you had one to one in some cases, or you had one to just a few. Now you've got to think about how do you re redesign and kind of restructure your customer engagement model to fit your, your team and your customers' needs. Um, so that will be today's session. And then next week, we're going to cover how to launch a customer uh, community platform. This is going to be really exciting uh, for those of you who have been following me on LinkedIn and following my story. We have actually been deploying higher logic behind the scenes here at Client Success. Really excited to share with you all of you know what we went through to get it built, stood up, selected even, and get that rolled out to our customers, which we're really excited to get that launched uh, next week. <laughs> so we'll, we'll share that with you all next week. So again, four great topics. Don't worry if you miss any of them. They're all recorded, all on demand, all available as long as you're registered. Okay, so for today's session, like I said, we're going to talk about moving to a pooled customer success model. So in this case, think about this, right? Think about the way that your technical support team might be supporting your customers, right? You've got customers who are, are writing in to maybe like a support at email alias, and you've got people that are picking up those tickets, answering those responses, right? And then hoping that they've resolved those issues for your customers so they can move on, continuing to get value from your platform. Similar concept executed differently. <laughs> so we're going to talk about this today. Um, where you know I'm coming from is I've worked in a lot of different companies, um, supporting a few different uh, engagement models and engagement types. And so we'll talk a bit about that and how this will lean into it. But if today is a time for you to think about pivoting and changing that, or you're a leader at a new company that needs a new strategy, uh, I think hopefully we'll we'll give you some tips and tools to help you get set up. So. Without further ado, let's dive in. I've got a lot of content and only 51 minutes to deliver it. So first thing I do want to just talk about is that, you know, when, when we started thinking about this at Client Success, you know, we have historically been a high engagement model. So what does that mean? We have had a low leverage ratio. So think very few customers to one CSM, right? Enabling our team to engage and have meetings and drive value with our customers in a very um, high cadence. So think like weekly, bi-weekly, um, you know, depending on what our customers' needs were. So today what we wanna talk about is the need to design a customer engagement model that works for your customers and for your business. 
the reality of it is, even if you want to have a one-to-one -one ratio with your customers, right? Like one CSM, one customer, it's highly unlikely you're going to be able to do so, right? The economics might not support it. Your model, your product might not need it. Uh, there's a ton of things that come into play and things that you need to evaluate. And so what I want us to focus on is not we have high, we've got low, we've got pooled, right? I want us to think about what do our customers need to be successful and what resources do we have available here to help deliver that? Because that's what it comes down to, right? What works for your customers and how can your business execute? So that's what we're going to dive into today is how to do this. It will be through the lens of that pooled model, which we'll talk about, and I'll give you a lot to think about as we go through. So I obviously love to talk about things that go wrong because guess what? In my history, um, I've seen and, and led a lot of failures. So how can I help you not fail? Um, so why do so many companies fail when they make a shift like this, right? One, out the gate, companies are making assumptions, right? Organizations, they design teams around engaged models that they think their customers need and want. Right. That could be that high engagement model. It could be a, a tech touch model, right, where they don't have any access to any people. Um, whatever the case may be, companies will fail when they make assumptions. And so we want to avoid that. Right. We want to think thoughtfully about what is it that our customers need and how can we make that a reality with the resources that we have in our organization available today? The second thing that companies do is the wrong resources. Right. You might have a CSM and say, you know what, we're going to keep hiring CSMs because they're going to be here as the internal orchestrator of all these resources and help our customers be wildly successful with their platform. Guess what? You might have a very, very technical, complex, highly configurable, highly customizable solution that requires technical resources. Right. So if you're just hiring a bunch of CSMs, they might not have the right skills. They might have the right experience to go and deliver what your customers need. So you don't want to allocate the wrong resources. You got to give it more thought, right? Who are the right people? What are the right skills that we need to bring to bear in support of our customers? So companies get it wrong all the time, right? They're making these assumptions. They're staffing the wrong resources. What's something else, right? Lack of value. Our customers are engaging with us, expecting that they're getting what they need from these conversations. And we're, we're almost demanding it, right? How many of your CSMs, whether you're an individual contributor or you're a leader, making a mandate that your, your team needs to meet with your customers every two weeks. And if they don't, right, everyone's in trouble. All the, all the health scores are going off. The reality of it is we don't lean into enough of, is this what our customers need to be successful? And are we able to bring the right value at the right time to deliver that outcome? So think about that, right? Like what is the value? What is the customer in need in all of the times and all those moments that they're interacting with you? How can we deliver value so that they're getting what they need when they need it? The last thing, no diversity. Please do not misread this. When I'm talking about diversity, I'm talking about diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of skills, right? You have, might have a customer success team that's been around for a while, right? And I love that. If, you, if you've got employees who have been with you for, for years at this point, good for you as a leader. You're probably doing something right. But if you've got the same customers working with the same CSMs for years on end, well, that's good, right? You have great relationships embedded. You've got a lot of knowledge, understanding about the company, about the customer. Sometimes that can get stale. It can get stagnant. And what's really nice about being able to bring different experiences and different point of views to the conversation is it can get you to think differently, right? How many times have you had a conversation with somebody else about something you've been personally working on and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't think about it that way. So these are important things to think about, right? Like how can we also bring new thought, new experiences, new ways of thinking to bear in supporting our customers? So when I think about why companies fail, it's some of these reasons. Now I'm sure companies are failing for a ton more reasons, but when it comes to designing engagement models, these are some of the things that we see that maybe we're not getting right. So when you're thinking about what is the appropriate engagement model, right? So I wanna make sure that before you all stick around for the full 60 minutes here, and maybe I bore you to tears, maybe I don't, um, that as we talk through shifting to a pooled model, this absolutely may not be appropriate for you. And so what I wanna force you to do before anything, right, is you think about what do we need to consider to determine what is the right model for our business and our customers? So the first consideration I want you to think about is the complexity of your software. 
Now, I'm sure if I could do a give me a show of hands, I'd get a whole bunch of hands popping up. Uh, if we were in person, right, that would be a ton of fun. But I mean, I love to compare things to Calendly because I think Calendly is one of the most intuitive, easiest to use pieces of software that I use every single day. Um, I don't need a CSM to teach me. I don't even need new training on product when it's rolled out. It's kind of intuitive enough to figure it out, use it as I need it, right? So that is a product that is not highly complex. I don't know that even, you know, with my organization that I would need a de dedicated or designated CSM to work with me every single week, every single month to optimize how we're using that calendar management. Um, however, if you're using something like Salesforce, I might need a little bit more handholding. I might need different resources. I might need a technical account manager. I might need a regular account manager. I might need a CSM. I might need access to an executive. I might need professional services, right? So because that platform is highly customizable, highly configurable, very technical, very complex, right? So we, we kind of use two examples on both ends of the spectrum, something like Calendly compared to something like Salesforce. Now, I'm sure most of us kind of fall somewhere in the middle, but you've got to think about the complexity of your software as it's going to determine how engaged your team will need to be in order to help your customers drive value. Now, remember, we don't engage for the sake of engagement. We don't do check-ins, right? We're not here to go and check in with you, Mr. or Mrs. Customer. How are you doing? No, no, no. We're here to drive value. So if you don't have anything to do to drive value, right, it's going to change your engagement. Required change management. Now, this is something else that I put out there for you to consider. What is the change management that is required in the organization? So think about your customers. How much change management has to occur in their organization, in their business, in order for them to use, adopt, and get value from your product? Right. That makes a big difference. So at Client Success, right, we are a customer success management product, which means we are deployed to help CS teams operationalize all of their customer engagements and management and risk and health and surveys. How CS teams have been operating before they deploy our software might look very different. So I wouldn't say that we are like at the tippy tippy top of the change management, but we're definitely on the higher end of that curve. So because of that, right, we need to think about how we are engaged to help drive that change, even if it's just in the initial months. Available resources, thinking about what your organization, your customer's organization rather, has available in terms of resources, as well as your own internal resources. Your team, your customers, they might not have technical resources on their team. They might not have admins. You know, when I think about working with the CS teams that we do, as far as our customer portfolio, some of them have op, uh, like ops managers. Most of them do not. Some of them have access to a Salesforce admin. Most of them do not. So I've always got to take into consideration what are the resources that are available on our customer's end, but then also what resources do I have? We know in this economic climate, right, that we are not many of us, or not all of us, I know there's some companies that are thriving right now, and good for you, um, but many of us are struggling, right? We've had to downsize, and in many cases, we've lost resources that we would have otherwise had available. So now you've got to think about what do our customers need, and what do we have available to help them with, right? What are the resources we can bring to bear? And the last thing is cost. Um, and, I, and I put this in here because I live in reality, right? If you've got customers who are paying hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in contract value to you, and you're never engaging them, you're never speaking with them, there, there might be an issue there, right? It feels a little imbalanced. So I'm not saying that cost is everything. I'm not saying that how much your customers pay should dictate how much they get from a human capital standpoint, but it is something that we need to consider, right? So even as you're thinking about how do I set up the different cohorts of my customers to think about an approach like this, cost is going to come into play. I'm just telling you that it is. So before you get started, I want you to think about these four things. There's probably a ton of other things that you'll need to consider, but I'm giving you four to start and say, think about this. What do our customers need to be successful and how and can we deliver that? So the next thing I want to do, I'm going to start with our customer life cycle. If you've been around for a couple of these boot camps in the past, you've seen a different life cycle. I mentioned this series that we've recently redesigned our customer life cycle here at Client Success. I've scaled it down. We've got three stages as opposed to our old model, which had four. Um, it's just a lot to do with all the changes that we're rolling out here, some of which we'll cover. Um, but it's important to think about your customer life cycle. And you know, when you're designing your life cycle, you should probably be doing so with the idea in mind that 
no matter your customer, right? They should be able to all go through this life cycle effectively. Some customers, how they go through it is going to look a little different than others, right? So that the how and the when, those might look like different variables for different customer cohorts. However, all of your customers should probably be going through the same journey. You're not going to have five different life cycles for five different customer segments, right? They're all ultimately here to do the same thing. That's going to look very similar. The how we get them there is what's going to, what might be deviating a little bit. So I say this because I think it's important to think about your customer life cycle and how you're going to orchestrate this. Because again, if it's the same life cycle and you're just going to execute it differently, depending on this engagement model, you're going to have to consider those variables. And so for me, this was a big part of how we got started. We took a look at our life cycle and said, okay, if this is the same for all of our customers, for, for cohort A, for cohort B, how do we make both of these the same reality, but execute them differently, right? And so we had to lean into things like automation and community and, and one-to-many uh, engagements. And so there's, a, there's so many things that we've had to now put in place in order for us to execute this idea and this vision that we have. But I will tell you, life cycle management, the exact same, how we do it a little bit different. So if you're starting to think about this as a viable path for your business, I do recommend, again, if you haven't designed your customer life cycle, maybe you start there, but if you have your life cycle, go review it and start to think about your design and execution through the different models. All right, so when we started to decide whether or not we wanted to make this big shift, and I'll give you the context here, right? So at Client Success, we've historically been a high engagement model, as I mentioned earlier. We're making a shift to a cohort of our customers moving to a pooled model, which we're kind of calling this community-led movement. Um, most of what we're going to do in terms of engaging and, and the strategy will all be orchestrated through our community platform. But in order to keep our customers engaged and have access to CSMs, we did want to have a CSM pooled model there to ensure that there were human resources available for our customers as needed. So in order for us to make this move, there was a bunch of things that we had to think about. And this is what I'll share with you today. First, we had to determine our coverage, right? Is this going to be all of our CSMs are going to be pooled or would it be certain CSMs? If, uh, if it would be part of the day, right? Like, so we're going to do pooled some hours of the day. Is it going to be spread out, right? Like, so we had to think about what would coverage look like and who would be a part of this pooled model should we design it? The second thing we had to think through is what are all the resources we had at our disposal? This was a really cool and fun exercise. So regardless if you're going to a pooled model or not, I think it's really critical to just understand what you have available because you've got tons of stuff from marketing. You've got webinars, you've got articles, blog posts. Uh, you guys probably have a knowledge base that your support team runs. Um, your product team is putting stuff out. You've got um, just all kinds of content, I'm sure, like readily available that you're not even using or leveraging effectively. One of the cool things that we had to do when we went through this, this exercise is go and find all of that content, right? What were all the resources that we would have that we can use to support this shifted strategy? So Go think about that. Like, what are all the resources you have? Again, even if you're going to pulled or not pulled, there is a wealth of stuff that you can use better, smarter than you probably are today. So go check it out. Um, then we had to think about early warning signals, right? How, how are we going to be able to do this, right? Like, we can't just move all of our customers to a pooled model and not have a way to monitor if they are still using the platform effectively, if they're engaging with our brand and our business and our CSMs. So we had to think about what are the early warning signals that we'd want to put in place um, and then how would we execute that? New processes, right? This was gonna be key. We couldn't, we couldn't assume that all the old processes that we had in place would work in this new model. Many things were gonna have to be modified. So we had to make a list of like, what were the key processes that we're gonna have to really augment or basically like rip up and, and start from, start from scratch, just so that they would accommodate this shifted strategy. So that's going to be another important exercise. Also, why it's important to go back to your customer life cycle and to look at your current engagement model to think, okay, if these things that we do are critical, super important, but we got to do them, but we got to do them differently. This is where you're going to have to really lean into designing new processes to help you orchestrate that. And the last thing is communication. 
Um, this, I, I mean, it's last on my list, probably first in my heart. Uh, if you don't manage communication around this program effectively, it will fail. And now I don't just mean communication to your customers. This is communication internally. It's getting buy-in. It's not just telling people what you're doing. It's getting them to come along for this journey because you're going to need every cross-functional team bought in and in support of a shift like this. This is a big change. So if you're going through this, you've got to make sure that you're managing communications and comms effectively throughout the entire migration to this model, as well as ongoing. So you got to think about what does that look like? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. You're going to see five slides that look like this. Each of these slides will follow all five of these little bubbles, right? So five little bubbles, five slides that look like this, very busy, but I'll break it down. So what I did at the top here, right? This is determining coverage. The top prompts four questions for you, right? Like what are four internal questions you should be thinking about as you're going through this? And then I, at the bottom, give you what are the things that we thought through here at Client Success? Now, I will tell you, we put together hours and hours of thought and remodeling here. So not, I, I absolutely could not share all of that with you in one hour and definitely not in five slides. So I did the best I could to say, here are four questions that we prompted ourselves to answer. Here's how we answered them. And this is how it's helping drive our shifted strategy here. So first, in determining coverage, we asked ourselves four things, right? Will you offer a pooled customer success model for all customers or would it be a specific cohort, right? It's gonna be important for you to figure out, is this all, is it a piece, is it none, right? Like, what does that look like? Do you envision all of your CSMs participating in this model or will it be specific CSMs? In some cases, I've seen folks that had CSMs who were working like a one to many, maybe they were like the long tail, they had like a thousand customers, which is crazy. Um, maybe they became a pooled CSM. Other organizations say, you know what, all of our CSMs are gonna be pooled because we're moving everybody to pooled. Others, it's like, we're gonna do this hybrid. So you gotta think through that, right? You have a set number of resources today. If you are still a growing CSM team, yay, good for you. Um, many folks though, we're locked. We have what we have today. We've got to work within those confines. So think about that. How are you going to use all the folks you have available today? Will pooled coverage hours be available every day or specific days? This was just one of the questions we had to answer, but how are we thinking about the availability of these pooled resources? And then the last question is, will you have CSM calendars pulled together? Will customers have the option of booking with specific CSMs, right? So when we thought about our coverage, we had to go through all of these things and many other questions we had to answer. But starting with these four, I'll tell you. So here's what we're planning to do at Client Success. We are breaking our customer base into two tranches. One will be a designated support and one will be this community led the community led will be prompted with a pooled customer success model, which means they will have the ability to speak with and engage with a CSM as they need, and they can go ahead and schedule that accordingly, right? So if these folks that live in this, this cohort, if they want to speak with a customer success manager once a month, once a week because they've got something going on, once a quarter, that's totally fine. They have the ability to proactively go and engage those teams and our teams will be available. The other tranches of our customers that have that designated support will have that still high engagement model, pretty much like a bi-weekly, weekly cadence for some of them, depending on their needs, where we are engaging them thoughtfully and strategically, they have access to that same person all the time. Now, things we had to think through that aren't here, but like, making sure that anybody who steps into an account to help, like do they have all the most current information and all these things. This is where our tech stack and using client success is really coming in handy. Um, we could possibly do a follow-up webinar on like how do you use customer success software to support these initiatives, but this was something we had to think through. So two, we're gonna have two different cohorts of our customer base broken down by various points of criteria. Um, some of our customers, it's really just based on like, what do they need, right? Do they need a designated CSM or, Will they be successful in this community-led program? So lots of different um, pieces of information came as we started to segment these customers out. Second is, do you envision all of your CSMs participating in the pooled model or specific CSMs? Full transparency. We don't have a big team here at Client Success, so all of our CSMs will participate, and participation will break out is basically going to be a Tuesday, Wednesday, thir uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday model, which I'll talk about here. So 
pooled hours, we're going to offer that by default Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So basically, I will have a CSM whose pooled day is Tuesday, a CSM whose pooled day is Wednesday, a CSM whose pooled day is Thursday, um, right? And this allows them to have better calendar control because they're not going to have to go midday and switch their, their hats and, oh, this is one of my designated customers versus this is a, a pooled customer, right? Like, in order for them to prepare and bring their best selves to work every day, um, my team's feedback was, hey, it would be better for us. It would be a better experience for us if we knew we had one day that was focused on this and then we would run that program for the full day. If customers need to book on a Tuesday, they're going to get this person. If they book on a Wednesday, they get that person on a Thursday, whatever. So they know that that's how it would be available um, obviously, if something comes up on a Monday or Friday, we have folks and resources available, but our pooled designated hours would be listed between those three days. Uh, for the last one, we're going to have all of our CSMs designated on coverage days, but I just mentioned we're going to have one calendar link so all of our customers can go very easily, use that same link all the time they can bookmark it. And if they need to book time, they book time based on their availability. If they happen to love a particular CSM and that CSM's pool today is on Wednesday, it's great. They can always book on a Wednesday and note they're always going to get that same person. But this model allows our team to manage this effectively and for our customers to have access to these resources. Now, why I love this also, going back to that point I mentioned earlier, diversity of thought and experience. All of my CSMs are fantastic. All of them have strengths in different areas, right? Some of them are super strategic and use the platform very creatively. Some have really great depth in how do you use, you know, client success for like program management. Others are really great in integrations and things like that. So there's a wealth of experience and different strengths, which I think having access to that, if I'm a customer, great. If I speak with Mary on Monday and, and Bob on, on Tuesday, I'm going to get two different points of view. I'm going to learn a little bit more than I would if I only spoke with the same person all the time. So going back to making diversity available for my, my customers, I think is also going to be an interesting advantage that they'll have. So these were some of the things that we had to go through when we determined coverage. Like I said, there was a ton of questions that were a part of this, but hopefully this helps you get some of the important ones out the way. Additional resources. So what resources um, would be available to provide to your customers to get immediate access to resources and content? What will your one-to-many approach look like? What new content will you create to support your customers? How will you leverage cross-functional teams to support this new initiative? So first thing that we're thinking through is um, we're deploying community. So like I mentioned earlier, we are taking a community-led approach here. Um, this is going to allow us, it's called CS Connect. This is going to allow us to really engage with our customers, allow our customers to engage with one another, engage with additional resources in our business. And so we feel like this is actually going to give them access to more than they were getting prior to this. Um, previously, right, we did not have a community platform. Our customers had access to things like our knowledge base, uh, webinars that were on demand or live webinars as they attended, but this is going to extend the reach of what we're able to provide tenfold. So we're really excited to make this new resource available as part of this initiative. Uh, we also hear from our customers all the time that they want to speak with one another, right? They're likely to learn more from their peers about what they're doing and how they're using the platform. And so we believe that there is immense value in having and facilitating those conversations as well. So what will your one-to-many approach look like? So we're going to offer a, a various uh, series, and this is going to be a one-to-many strategy, meaning it's going to be set content. Um, and so we're going to have one that's technical office hours. This is like kind of speak with a support person. We know that our customers often would love to get things resolved quickly over the phone if they've just got a quick question, as opposed to submitting a support ticket and waiting for that to go through that process. Um, being able to just hop on a call and ask somebody a question is a great way to help resolve and also make sure that they're getting value quickly so they can go and move on to what they were trying to trying to accomplish. We're going to have CSM-led sessions. This is more around brainstorming strategies on how to use the platform. So these will also be available regularly where our customers can come, they can attend. Um, obviously, all things will be recorded and made available, but this will help with brainstorming, right? What are unique ways that we could be using the platform today to accomplish specific use cases? So it's really led by what do we know that our customers are trying to do in the platform? 
For example, we've got some pretty cool um, parts of our platform that we've seen creative ways that our customers are using it for like, we've got some customers who are on consumption models who have taken really cool avenues into using our goals module. Um, I would love to be able to share that more, you know, broadly with our customer base to talk about how they did that, why they did that, what they got out of it. And so facilitating those conversations, also facilitating introductions so they can talk more about it. And then we're also going to be offering leadership sessions. So think about like what we do here with these CS Leadership Bootcamp series. We're going to be going a little bit more in depth um, with our customer base and offering these on a more regular basis based off of topics and areas of interest for them. Um, for example, I get a lot of people that reach out to me on LinkedIn who want to talk about compensation or right now it's like interview questions. Um, these are things that we can tackle together as a community. And so these will be things that will facilitate don't necessarily have to be driven by me, my, my approach, but we want to help facilitate those conversations so our leaders are, are learning from other leaders as well. New content that we'll create to support this. Um, so one of the things that we've gotten started with already is we created an entirely new onboarding portal. This has allowed us to streamline our onboarding experience immensely. So we've got rich content in there, all new videos, um, all very like short vignettes to make it very digestible, a whole new flow. So it's a guided onboarding uh, portal and experience. And so you go through it and it tells you exactly where you have to be, how you have to do it. Um, really robust. Our customers' feedback so far has been wonderful. They love it. Um, we've also added a ton of templates to it as well as workbooks. And so it's really rich with helping our customers get the platform stood up. Uh, with little to no effort. I basically have given them, here's everything I have done and you can go and copy paste or you can do it yourself and modify it. And so our customers really have appreciated all the extra work that we've put in to helping them with their initiatives. So we're going to be creating more content like that. Uh, that's one example of something we've created up front to start to facilitate some of this, but we'll continue to create content. Um, one of the cool things that we can see in the community platform is that federated search. Um, so we'll be able to see like what are people looking for and searching for. So if it's product related stuff, we'll know that we need to tackle that from a product learning training enablement. Um, if it's more themes around, you know, strategy or thought leadership, we can tackle those in sessions as well or create new content around it. So we're also going to be using all the new information and insights that we'll have access to to help make a more thoughtful strategy as well. And then how will we leverage cross-functional teams to support this? Every single person in our company has to be bought in and supporting this initiative, right? So our sales team is going to be helping with engagement. It's a great way for them to stay engaged with their prospects after the deal is sold. Our client success is basically, you know, our sales team closes it and then it gets handed off to our team. They very rarely stay engaged. Um, there's just not a need, right? They're not working upsells and expansions, things like that. Um, it's usually our team, but why shouldn't they stay engaged, right? They've got a great relationship. So how do we keep them engaged and checking in and making sure that, you know, customers that they made promises to that we've delivered on that. Um, marketing is going to help with a lot of new content. So being able to understand what our customers need, what they're looking for, being able to create more content that is specifically geared towards customers, not just prospects. Um, product with innovation. So our new community platform has um, an idea exchange. So we previously used a platform called Canny. We've moved that all into our community platform. So product is going to be able to see all of our customers' ideas and recommendations, things that are getting upvoted, things that our customers really want. And hopefully that'll help stir those conversations and also influence roadmap and ideation as well. Um, leadership our leadership team should be highly engaged with our customers through the community as well um, in support of this new pooled model and support with content. So, you know, obviously this is not a limited list of what everyone will be doing. Everyone will be doing a ton behind the scenes, but these are some things that we can seed today to say, here's ways that our cross-functional teams are supporting us because everyone will need to make help make this a reality. So the next thing I talked about was early warning signals, um, right? So a few things that we prompted here is how can we keep track of customer health? Obviously, health is going to look different for the cohort of customers we've moved into this pooled model than we would otherwise. What will engagement need to look like in the new model, right? Like what is healthy engagement? And we'll talk about that. Um, when there's no risk, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> when there is risk, who will be responsible for intervention, right? Like if nobody owns it, um, if nobody's accountable, then nobody owns it. So we'll talk through what we've come up for that. And then who owns ongoing risk of the customer, right? So maybe it takes a little while to get them out of that risk state. 
So, and remember, this is new to all of us. So we're going to be iterating on this. We haven't solved this. This isn't like we, we've nailed it, but we are going to work, work through this. This is what our team deems will be a, a good place to start. So first, designing a new customer health score with metrics that are focused on engagement in the community, product adoption, sentiment, and overall usage. So we're shifting our, our customer health. So we will have a new segment of how we've broken the two customer cohorts out. And the new one that we have in this pooled model will also have a new health score that will allow us to track, um, one, how they're engaging the community. That's a big one for us because the community is going to be a big pillar of this. We want to make sure that they're leveraging it effectively and getting value from it. Um, product adoption is still going to be key for us. So how are they using and adopting the product? Sentiment. Right? How do they feel? We we're also building out an entire new customer feedback loop, which will hopefully allow us to collect feedback early and often from our customers, being able to understand that in correlation with overall usage of the platform. We are a customer success platform, right? Customer success teams are always engaging with customers, which means they should always be using our platform, right? They should be tracking it. They should be using it to make informed business decisions. So at the end of the day, um, our customers should be in the platform all the time. We're looking at that as a key indicator there as well. Historically, we worked uh, to maintain a biweekly cadence for customers. Now we're looking for them to engage with the CSM every 45 days. So if they're in this cohort, we think that that's an appropriate amount of time. We may change that. It may be... 30 days, it may be 60 days. We don't know yet. So we are, we're putting a stake in the sand right now and saying that 45 days feels like a healthy place for us to start. It's a little bit longer than we previously had some engagement, but if they're using and getting value from the other resources we've now made available, we're hoping that they'll need less connection with a dedicated or designated CSM. Internal risk flags uh, will trigger automations for us. So like, how are we going to manage risk for intervention. So first thing, anytime that there is a uh, customer who's dropping in customer health, it will trigger different notifications, both internally and externally. So there will be a slew of automations that are tied to different, um, different changes in that customer health, depending on what they are and what those metrics are. That will allow us to have immediate intervention, right? immediate action when something does occur. Um, we'll also have the ability to leverage our pooled CSMs or executive sponsors there, depending on the risk and the impact it'll have on the partnership. So looking at a lot of those things as well. And then depending on customer and the risk in terms of like who owns that ongoing risk of the customer, um, we are working on pathing right now. So our CSM team has agreed if there is a customer who is in a high risk state, they're going to hold on to it. Like one of our CSMs will hold on to it until we've helped nurture that customer back to a healthy state. Um, ensuring that we can kind of place them back in that pooled model effectively. In some cases, right, that could be we've got a new executive and they don't, they weren't the ones who purchased client success. They don't know anything about us, right? That CSM might need to hold on for a little bit to retrain, to resell, to, to help them reconfigure. They might have a new vision of CS, right? So like, how can we help them get the platform stood up in a way that emulates and mirrors their strategy? Um, in which case, once we've done so, right, maybe they're in a place where they can effectively and independently use it there on their own. So there's ways that we're going to help continue to manage that on an ongoing basis. New processes. So a few things that we asked as prompts here was what processes will you need to modify to accommodate the new strategy? How will you track which customers will be managed uh, which way? What's the plan to track the impact of new processes? Because again, you know, that's important. You've got to be able to track the effectiveness. And when will you work to mitigate um, the impact based on what's working, what's not? So in some cases, we're going to have to make changes. We don't assume that out the gate that everything we've designed is going to be perfect. So what we're doing is we're starting we're starting with a modified onboarding experience. As I mentioned, we designed this whole new uh, portal experience for our customers. So we're starting there. That was the first process that we rebuilt and redesigned. Um, and really, the idea there is that we made it more more efficient in helping our customers go through a self-guided onboarding experience. They're still going to have a designated CSM who's working with them through onboarding, but we've given them more tools, more resources to do this a bit more independently than they had previously. Um, I would say our old onboarding, which was good and thorough, relied heavily on our customers having the answers to a lot of things um, that many of them just quite frankly didn't. And so, and that's okay, right? So we wanted to just make sure that we were bringing those, those answers to bear in support of them. So, um, that was a big thing for us. We are redesigning things like our renewal process, uh, different uh, survey strategy, because again, that feed feedback loop, we want it to be 
early and often we want to make sure that we're hearing from our customers what's working, what's not, um, and new risk playbooks, because those will all be dependent on different factors of how our customers are, you know, thriving in this new model. Second thing we did is we looked at, um, we're going to create all new customer segments, as I mentioned. So there will be two different cohorts we'll be tracking um, in our designated. They'll probably be like kind of subcategories. So we might have, there's going to be more than two categories uh, or segments rather, but two big main tranches of how we, we measure them out. New health scores, uh, new reporting dashboards, new pulse reason codes. Um, in client success, for those of you who are not familiar, we do have a product called Pulse. Uh, it's really powerful. It's probably all of our customers' favorite product to use. You do have the ability to create new reason codes, uh, both risk factors and success factors to track where the customer is in their pulse. We'll obviously be creating some new categories, new tagging that our CSMs can use uh, effectively when they're doing their pulse updates. So those are a few of the ways that we're tracking that. Uh, we'll also track life cycle management um, through our success cycles. So success cycles in client success are like playbooks. Um, many platforms have something similar. They may call it something else. For us, it's success cycles. And so we'll use this to help orchestrate all of the new processes that we've developed. Uh, we'll be able to see where our customer is getting stuck Right. So that happens. Right. If they're spending too long in one stage or or around one area, what's going on there? So we'll just have the ability to pay closer attention to things that we're mapping out a little bit more detailed than we probably had previously because we had that human human to human engagement, that ongoing relationship. So that will definitely help us there um, and be able to see that health score impact, which is going to be critical. And then we've got a plan here broken down over the first 120 days. Uh, I'm not tone deaf. I do recognize it's going to be a big change for a lot of our customers. We want to make sure that we're getting it right. This should feel additive because at the end of the day, right, we've got a small team. The team can only meet as often as the team can meet. They can only respond to emails as quickly as they can respond to emails. They can only, you know, make themselves available to do work for our customers as much as they have built into their calendar. But the more customers we add, the smaller that availability becomes. So we're hoping that this actually creates a better experience because they'll feel like they're getting bigger, better access to more than they had previously. That is the hope here. But First 90 days, uh, we plan on collecting feedback from customers and the frontline team. So we will be reaching out to customers directly who are part of this program to hear what their thoughts are. Any concerns will work to mitigate any issues or points of friction uh, as quickly as possible, as well as our CSMs, who will obviously be speaking on behalf of customers that they've been engaging with. We'll use that to modify as much as needed up in the first 90 days. Then we'll use days 60 to 120 to really just measure and watch, right? So after we've made some initial changes to kind of flush out any issues, points of friction, we wanna just let that run for a little while so we can collect some data to see what's working and what's not. If we keep changing it too often, we won't actually ever really know. So we are gonna use at least that 90 day period to, to gauge as a barometer of like, okay, how effective is this program and where do we need to step in what's not working? So that's how we're thinking about our new processes, some of the questions that we asked and ways that we're tackling it here at Client Success. And the last area here was communications. Um, as I mentioned, super important. So things that we prompted were, you know, what's your internal communication strategy? How do you plan on getting cross-functional buy-in? This is a big one for us at the gate. What's your customer communication plan? Gosh, I, I could have used like five slides to just kind of talk through what we've been thinking about here. How will you collect customer feedback on the new strategy? And then how are you going to continue to have open lines of communication with customers in lieu of a CSM? So what we did is initial discussions started uh, with our CX org. So everything initiated with my team. To be honest with you, there was no sense in me bringing this to leadership or to anyone else if my team wasn't bought in, if I didn't have their support, and if they didn't think that this was something that was going to help them and help their customers. So honestly, I started with my frontline team because they were the ones that were going to have the biggest voice in helping us understand if something like this was possible, feasible, and could be successful. The second thing we did is I brought this now to our leadership team uh, for that initial internal buy-in. This was important. Um, I needed to make sure that my cross-functional leaders all understood why we'd be recommending a change like this and how we're going to go about doing it. I need to put their concerns at ease, also address concerns that maybe I hadn't thought of, right? Everybody's going to think differently about this, but that was really important. Um, and then obviously after that, had to make sure that what we did uh, was gonna make sure all that communication continued to flow in real time. So it wasn't just about these isolated meetings. It's like, how do I keep people updated about what we're doing, how we're doing it, when we're doing it? Um, so that continues to be part of our ongoing strategy is just making sure everyone's aware of what's happening. 
communication with other customers. So we're not there yet. Um, so we're probably about another month or so away before we we head this direction. But all of our customers will be notified. Um, we're going to start this change via email just to kind of prompt some some activity, some education around what's happening well in advance. Um, we're obviously going to leave some webinars around this to educate, to answer questions. We want people to feel comfortable, be very clear on what's happening. We don't want anyone to feel like they're getting anything less than, but we do need to pivot our strategy here. Um, async communications, we love that. Not all of our customers can attend webinars. Not all of them want to. Um, maybe email doesn't work, right? But like, how do we make ourselves available to ask and answer questions with our customers asynchronously? So we'll use different tools and systems to facilitate that as well. Um, and then in-app messaging also to make sure that for folks that are in the platform, they're not missing this either. So we're going to do our best to make sure, and then obviously through CSM communication, right? So right now, because there's a CSM on every customer that we have, making sure that they're bringing to those conversations, right? And alerting them of what's coming, what they can expect and anticipate, what that will look like. So there'll be some additional um, enablement that'll happen with the team to help facilitate those customer communications as well. Like I said, this, this second gray box could be very, very long. We've kind of thought through a lot of things. I just tried to put some highlights in there. Um, new feedback loop, like I mentioned, we're going to be creating a whole new survey series. This will allow us to kind of follow the customer lifecycle, collecting feedback early and often. That feedback will definitely be triggering different activities and engagement internally. If we're getting customers who are like, this is horrible. I need more help. I'm not getting what I need. Obviously, that will sound all the appropriate alarms for us. And we'll make sure that we're reaching out and we're understanding what the customer's challenges are, what they need, and then how do we intervene and uh, obviously address appropriately. So that will help us there. Obviously, our customers will still be engaging with CSMs. So using those engagement points will also be critical. And then ongoing communication with our customers. We're going to be thinking about things through, like, obviously, email, automation, in-app messaging, ongoing webinars, community will be a big part of it, and then one-on-one -on -one engagement as needed. So that ongoing communication will still be there. Um, like I said, this shouldn't feel like we're taking anything away from our customers. We're just changing how things are delivered. The problem here is that I know for a lot of folks, change is hard, change is uncomfortable, and so we're going to have to navigate some of those uh, challenges uh, as opposed to even just the program design. So we're, we're ready for that. So that's how we navigated those five areas. Uh, a few things to consider if you are thinking about going this, this direction. One, is this right? Right? Is this the right the right approach for you, your customers? I gave you a lot of things to think about earlier or told you why companies fail. You really need to give it some thought. Is this is this right? Do not just do things because everyone in the CS community is talking about these new strategies, right? These new ways of doing it. If it doesn't make sense for your business, don't do it. The second thing for you to consider is can you support this? Um, do you have the right resources to execute this correctly? I'm telling you, it is very easy to get this wrong. I'm sure we will fail before we will succeed, but we are prepared to do that. Um, and so this is something you got to think through is do we have the right people? Do we have the right resources and tools and content? So it might take a little while to get to a place where you could actually support it. Can you track it? I'm big on this. Um, if you don't have a way to like manage this program effectively and pay attention to it with data and metrics and can really see what's happening, um, I, I hesitate to roll something like that out because that is where something will go wrong. That is where something will fall through the cracks. So just something to pay attention to there. And then for you to consider is not the right time, right? For a lot of companies, you're doubling down on their customers because sales are down. The economy is, is not doing great. So this might not be the right time for you. For us, right, we're trying to think about how do we give our customers more in a different experience because we want to give them more, but we just don't have more people to staff behind that more. So we've got to be different. We got to think differently about what we're offering. So those are four things for you to consider before you go ahead and get started. Um, as always, I love to leave you with like five things to think about. So this is standard format. If you've never been to my webinar before, cover five things every time. So just so you um, have some visibility here, first, Design a program that leaves customers feel like five ways to fail, right? So just want to <laughs> so if you want to fail, design a program that leaves customers feeling like they're getting less, right? The idea here is to feel like you're giving your customers more, more content, more access, more information, more experience, right? Because that is what this program is designed and intended to do through different channels, through different mechanisms, through different ways. But if you design this and your customers feel like they're getting less than they had previously, you're going to fail. Second way to fail, rely on the same processes that your team used in a high engagement model. Those processes can't be executed in this same framework. 
So you've got to be thinking differently about all the processes that you have in place and how can you streamline them, right? How can you alter them, augment them in a way that's going to make sense for this new approach? Number three, you're going to fail. Failure to bring in automation to your customer life cycle. You cannot expect things to be happening manually, right? For example, like all email communication cannot go out from your CSMs. You've got to have tools to send that out. You have to have automation that will trigger notifications or tasks or have prompts go out to your customers or in-app communication. You have to figure out a way to use technology to support you here because every single piece of engagement that requires a human, you're going to get stuck. It's going to create another point of friction because you're not going to be able to do it. So think about how you use technology and automation. Four, you're going to fail if you don't have a way to me measure this. Like I said earlier, you have to be able to figure out how to have visibility into whatever it is you're doing. So be able to track that engagement, customer behavior, sentiment. Those are all key things you need insight into. If you do not have a way to track and measure those things today, you will not be successful. Last, mismanaged communications with your customers and internal team members. Um, communication is key always, right? The number one way to fail is poor communication, right? When there is ambiguity, when people don't understand what's happening, they will create a narrative, right? So if you haven't given them one, they will create one of their own. So if they feel like they don't know what's happening, right? Oh, all of a sudden we don't have a CSM anymore. And I don't know what's going on, right? That's what they feel. That's what they know. And that's their experience. If you're not managing this effectively, your program will not be successful. So you've got to think about ways to manage that communication effectively. So I know I went a little fast. I had a lot of content today, guys. So I appreciate you bearing with me. I'm sure on a replay, there is a slow mode button where you can just knock me down a few pegs. Um, but trying to fit all this stuff into 60 minutes is a killer. So I appreciate you all bearing with me. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I'm going to go ahead and see if we could take some questions. So I appreciate you all. Um, we've got four minutes. Let's see what I can do in four minutes. Okay. Um, so first question, do you share the names of the pooled resources with the end customer? And what about sales? Should they should they come to know we're skeptical of putting a pooled resource name in front of the customer available all the time. Got it. So listen, at client success, we want to be super transparent. My CSMs are my CSMs. You can go on LinkedIn and see who they are. We don't have billions of them. We are a small team. Yes, all of my CSMs are going to be broadcasted on a page on the booking page. The reason we're doing that is I want to highlight each of their areas of expertise and experience, because if my my customer needs somebody who is like really, really strong at Salesforce integrations and revenue manager, guess what? I want them to speak to my girl, Krista, because she knows that stuff inside and out. She's going to bring a ton of value. I want my customers to really connect with the team and understanding, hey, this person is great for me to go to for this. Or, hey, I want to do strategy. I need to understand this. KGP on the team. She's awesome at that. She's going to come up with creative new ways for me to solve and solution these five things. So yes, we are going to make them available. It's by booking availability, you know, first come first serve. So we, we're not going to hide behind that. We, you know, our resources are our team and that's what we want to stand behind. So we are going to make those available. Um, next question is, who is responsible for thinking through Cool CSM processes, enhancements, listening to customer feedback, et cetera. Is it me as the chief customer officer or a group of leaders, or is there another leader dedicated to it? Um, to, let me just tell you, we are going to win together, fail together. So this is not just me. I do not know all the answers. I promise you that. Um, so this will be a group effort. So it will be, we are going to start with the frontline team. Uh, so that will be my CSMs, my support and services organizations. Um, we are going to be the ones talking through what's working and what's not. My team is going to have great visibility and understanding of what's working. So we're going to be working on this and designing it and taking that feedback together and iterating as a group. Um, bringing my team into this also empowers them, right? And I really do want to feel like my team feels empowered, they feel supported, and they feel heard. The best way for me to demonstrate that as a leader is to bring them into the process. This is not my program. This is our program. Uh, another question, uh, what's your experience selling the pooled concept internally? What kind of resistance did you get, if any, and how'd you overcome that? Oh, of course we get resistance. Nobody likes this. Um, you know, everyone panics. I, I would say the first team to panic at first was sales, right? Because, you know, they know that this, you know, selling customer success uh, resources is part of 
the package that you get has been really compelling for them. And so, yes, yeah, that was a concern, right? Like, how do we com com how do we compete, right? If if our competitors are saying, oh, you get a CSM and you get this and you get that, and we're saying you don't get a CSM, what does that say for us? So sales was tough. Um, and so this is where I said, we had to spend a lot of time talking through how this is additive and not less than. And we're gonna have to continue to educate the teams on how to communicate it, how to talk about it. I said, I'd be happy to get on calls with prospects who were concerned about the model. It's new and new is hard. And we're here to work through that. Um, so I won't say that I have fully overcome any concern or all concerns just yet, but we are navigating it openly and honestly with one another as leaders. And uh, we're going to do the best that we can for our customers. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all care about. It's less about who's getting it right and whose process is being implemented. It's are our customers okay, right? Like that's going to be our big, that's going to be the big barometer of like, is this okay? Um, are they okay? So uh, I'm sure I'll continue to have a little bit of, uh, I wouldn't say resistance. I will have some concerns I'll have to continue to navigate and that's just part of it. Did I restructure your contracts for those customers with an assigned CSM as part of premium service? We're not selling this yet, so I wouldn't say it's a premium service. And we're obviously going to be very thoughtful about how we roll this out. This isn't going to be like a rip the band-aid and all of a sudden a whole tranche of customers no longer have something that they felt like they had before. We are, we are going to take a very thoughtful approach to this. In the future, um, we are happy to entertain this as a premium service where we can sell it. So if customers need or want a designated customer success manager, it will be an option. But we are definitely in a crawl, walk, run stage right now of crawl. Um, and so we've got to do this part first before we can think about restructuring contracts. We're just not there yet, but it is absolutely something that is on our radar. We'll probably get to it later in the year. Um, and... Last question here that I can probably answer. Um, I'm excited to join the CS Connect community. Will all CS users be invited to join? Do we as a CS customer uh, manage be invited from our organization? Okay, very good. So uh, yes, for, for our customers, so anybody who is a client success customer, our new CS Connect community uh, will be rolling out uh, in mid-March. So stay tuned for communications around that. If you are interested in getting early access, you can let your CSM know and they will put you on my list. I will get you early access because we want people to be in there, seating goodies, all great all great content so we'd love to have more of you in there if you're interested uh but we'll we'll talk more about that privately on client success uh and more client success conversations so i know i didn't get to everything but we are at time i just want to thank you all so much for showing up again to be a part of these cool conversations i love the questions you're all asking like i said um i know i go fast in these it is really just because i'm trying to get so much into 60 minutes uh maybe these need to be 90 minutes in the future um because then i could breathe and have water right okay so next week we're going to come back we're going to talk about community if you've got any questions let us know we will be getting the recording out this week so stay tuned you'll get the recording and you'll get my presentation as always you've got follow-up questions you want to dive into something you want to do a private session with me to explore this further uh reach out to me on linkedin i'm happy to schedule some time with you but thank you all again for your time have a great rest of your week and we'll talk again soon